Okay, so today on the Plant Cutting Podcast, we have Ben Falk, and Ben is a renowned permaculturist, the author of The Resilient Farm and Homestead, put out 10 years ago now, and you're putting out a new edition soon? That's the plan, yeah. It's it's written, and now we just got to go through the editing phase, basically. Awesome. Cool, cool. And your videos on YouTube have been an inspiration to a lot of people, including me. And you do a permaculture design course and consultation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else that, that in your wheelhouse? I mean, anything under the regenerative, resilient site development rubric is our focus. You know, I do a lot with ponds, right. pond siting and development and design. I've gotten quite into just yeah, water, yeah, water retention features, swales, ponds, patties. Um, and wood heat is a big geek out of mine for a lot. Well, you know, 20 plus years since I've been up here, we've mm-hmm. taken the wood heat systems quite far. I'm actually doing a workshop on that next week. So getting really psyched about that because it's just low hanging fruit to do a lot more with wood than most people are doing. Yeah. So you're also like a homesteader. That's like your lifestyle. Yeah, you do. It is. Yeah. Time. I do. And I don't, I feel like I'm a little less hardcore than I used to be, but um, yeah, it's still like our guiding thing, you know, it's just try to meet our basic needs. Yeah. I think that's really important. Yeah. So one of the other things that you're known for is uh, sea berries, which I think is a, one of the most amazing plants in the world. And I think it was two years ago, you, you put out a call on your Facebook that you were going to send out some sea berry seeds to people for free. And so I was like, I want to grow those. We just got a homestead. I want to, I want to do that. So I did it and they're growing. I mean, it takes them a little while to, to get awesome. big, to start bearing, yeah. but they're yeah. doing it. And our, our friend neighbors actually Ha- they have sea berries and they're starting to get in production really heavy. And so wow. we've been the last few years been making sea berry oxymel every year awesome. and it through the winter. And it's, it's just one of the most amazing drinks. <laughs> it's delicious. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it really is. Actually, this is a, this is an autumn. I mentioned the mead before we started recording and that I'm having a little right now. And this is a sea berry mead with autumn berry in it too. Mm. Cool. Yeah. So That's another you tell- good thing to do. With it. <laughs> yeah. And one of the other things is uh, like AC is an herbalist. Your wife is also an herbalist, naturopath. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and sea berries are an amazing food as medicine plant too. Um, it, it, yeah, absolutely. Would you like to share with our audience a little bit about sea berries uh, if yeah. they're not familiar? Yeah, um, a lot of people know them as sea buckthorn. I don't, I don't, I like to call them sea berry because they're not particularly related to buckthorn, which right. a lot of people know about and, and have issues with because it's very dispersive and aggressive successful where it where it grows we don't really have buckthorn here but um it's not any more related to buckthorn than it is you know an orange tree (laughs) or (laughs) whatever you know a grape or anything but uh, it's a nitrogen fixing shrub that is really hardy to cold it's it's hardy to salt spray can grow near roads it's hardy to really poor soil and it's from like Pan Asia, like Eurasia, Northern Eurasia, originally. And now it's been in North America. Probably Russian immigrants brought it to North America, you know, longer than ago than most of us realized. But um, mm-hmm. Jim Gilbert at One Green World, who's an amazing plant explorer, as far as I know, did a lot of work to get a lot of named varieties in the United States through his nursery, amazing nursery out west one green world and i think he you know went to moscow and and other experiment stations throughout russia um the russians really have developed a lot of um a lot of name varieties and germany has as well and parts of the old russian federation Lat- latvia has big sea berry production um germany northern europe scandinavia but right at the probably the place it's known most is Russia. Like the only people I've seen at a distance see it and be like, oh, Seabury are Russian people when they visit here. And like, I kind of, at this point, I'm like, oh, you you must be Russian if you know that. (laughs) And that's the only place I've seen it on menus. I was in Washington, D.C. once on a consult and there was Seabury vodka on a menu in a Russian restaurant. Cool. Yeah. So it's not, it's still not really known in this country like so many plants that are very commonly known in in Europe and and also Asia. Um, So apparently it was a huge source of vitamin C in Germany during the war. 
uh, during the World War II because they couldn't get oranges. Mm -hmm. It's like 20 times the orange um, or vitamin C density of oranges and orange juice or more loaded with um, A, E, and C. And also the cool, the amazing thing to me is that it's 10 to 15% fat, fatty yeah. acid, especially omega-7s, which is a very hard fatty acid to get. I call it a fish on a bush because of that. It's like got fish quality mm -hmm. oils. Right. And, you know, we don't have much in the way of fish here in interior New England. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of like our coconut slash avocado in terms of like a fatty source, high, high quality fat from a from a perennial woody plant. So that that makes it really special. And the fact that it'll grow, you know, with in very poor fertility conditions to me is like kind of a fountain of health and regeneration and it's a nitrogen fixer um so it's kind of like a no-brainer to plant when i learned about all this i was like well let's just plant them i had never tasted it this is about probably about 14 years ago we did a project where we were actually paid for a year to research all the possible coolest most regenerative health promoting plants we could possibly grow in this climate from zone three to six and we're in four four b and Seabury just emerged as like, hey, we, we got to try this. But I, I hadn't seen it at that point. Like before I planted them, I had never seen the plant. I had never eaten Seabury. I had never tasted it till our own Seabury's fruited. Mm -hmm. That's actually true for a lot of the plants that I've tasted <laughs> here. It's just, that I, you know, they're not around here. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, it's great. It's definitely a, a high level of difficulty plant, though. I mean, you know, need a male and female. It's not drought tolerant, contrary to what all the literature says. I finally have wrapped my mind around that, that it's not actually drought tolerant, especially when it's being established. But even after, I've killed a lot of sea berries in dry spots. Wow. Um, yeah. That's good to know. So that's really important to know because all the nurse, you know, a lot of the literature says it's drought tolerant. You hear about huge plantings in China, in very dry areas, in the plains of Canada, where it's quite arid in some ways at least compared to you know the northeastern u.s and i can just tell you from planting it on many sites and watching it now for almost 15 years it's it 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 thrives like on top of the water table on a map i mean like many things on a mound on high water it's raging but i mean i've seen them grow plant them on a pond berm on a, on a uh, uh, right next to a pond and it'll shoot across the mown top of the berm and sh and then sprout up right next right at the water line it'll just grow like two feet a year right there wow and if you can nurse it along on dry sites you won't see them sprout and really like be super happy right mm -hmm. so put them in a wet area you know wet to mildly wet area okay would be yeah, my, that's... would be my suggestion they really don't like it dry Seems like a side of the road or like close to the road is a decent spot because those often, you know, often have more sun because yeah. they also really need a lot mm -hmm. of sun. That and they can have a lot of moisture coming off the road. Yeah. 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 But they, and they don't care about heavy soil. I mean, like I said, I've never seen them grow as fast as I have in a pond burn. Right. Intentionally machine compacted ground. <laughs> like crap. Like, you know, subsoil from, way down deep made into the berm packed with an excavator and they just yeah. just yeah. like a fountain <laughs> seems like they're pretty resilient yeah i mean they they i think people with some found you know some um basis will say you know is it a is it an invasive plant you know should we be really concerned about it like anything in the right context could be considered um of concern in that way you know, for us, we've killed as many sea berries. We've grown up. I don't, I don't see them spread like alder or, uh, well, goldenrod or white pine. You know, things that are have been here a long time. Yeah. But you know, they can get, they can shoot up a bit, and you can need to mow around certain patches if you want to keep them from rundering a bit. Yeah. If they're nice. if they're really happy, but that's true with a lot of plants. You know. So is the seaberry oxymel, which is vinegar and honey as like a concentrate that you can drink and add water to, is that your favorite preservation yeah. for it? That's yeah. pretty much what we do with it. Yeah. Okay. 
Because yeah. it's not really something like blueberries or eating handfuls of it. Yeah, I don't eat them raw. I mean, you know, little kids like like them raw. They're super sour. I mean, I'll I'll eat some. They're good for you. But yeah. um, yeah, we we freeze them whole. You know, in in bags, they freeze very well, and then we just thaw them as the winter goes on and make the oxymel, yes. which is mostly the sea berry and then honey, a good bit of honey. We just put our whole comb honey right in it, wax and all, like a. Mm like a cup per gallon, like pretty liberal amount. And then just a few dashes of our apple cider vinegar, Yeah. Um, okay. you know, to taste. I mean, you could go more, I think traditional oxymels usually have more vinegar than that, but. Well, the sea berries are pretty uh, sour too. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Those yeah. And then we, and then we leave them in the fridge and, and you know, they'll, they will start fermenting and become almost like a soda, like a little bit of a nice ferment in a few weeks. Um, but they're not, you know, they're not going to keep in the fridge like that for, a very long time yeah okay mm -hmm. so the, that liquid form freezing them and then making yeah. oxymels is the way yeah and then you could you know freeze a bunch of oxymel and mason jars if you want to but yeah that's what i did this year <laughs> mm -hmm. and yeah it, it worked out that pretty probably good. takes up less room if you're short on freezer space just make it all into oxymel but you know for us the harvest season's so busy it's more of a time is our limiting factor so it's just like we can yeah anything yeah. where you know, we bought an extra freezer last year so it was like anything that we can bump on from the harvest season to winter anything we can we can do in winter is always a win because everything else is so busy the rest of the year 100 percent. yeah mm -hmm. that's a very crucial point there um and it's also amazing when you're making the oxymel you can see the separation there's like a separation that happens in the juice and you can actually like see the fat oh yeah oh yeah the mega, mega sevens and it's pretty unreal almost i mean it's not like any other fruit juice except for like autumn olive or something yeah but i mean it's even higher than i think way higher than fat than autumn i mean i don't know if autumn olive is having i'm sure maybe it has a little bit of fat but i know no fruit in yeah. the northeastern u.s that even has really any fat to speak of and and like you said this will there's like a cream layer on the top <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's like yeah a... it reminds me of an orange creamsicle a little bit <laughs> imagine if you put some coconut milk in there and froze it as popsicles yeah. it would be just like a creamsicle <laughs> Oh yeah, well, yeah. Orange Julius. They could have sold yes. sea berry. Right. Yeah, they have malls and stuff. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it really does have I'm dating like a, myself. But. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's got the citrusy to me. It's like an orange pineapple flavor. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another flavor that you don't really get in the north either. That no. Sure. Like, it's like yeah. a citrus of the north too. Mm -hmm. It is. It's it's like sit. One way I put it is citrus times passion fruit times fifty. <laughs> okay uh -huh. just yeah. jacked up you know just really like citrus on steroids are really yeah. intense and you can taste the vitamin c in it yeah definitely <laughs> yeah yeah and the the, the omega-7s so um the, another amazing thing about it is that it fixes nitrogen uh because it's in the eliagnaceae and yeah that's an amazing family too um so do you grow other eliagnaceae you grow autumn olive do you grow gumi yeah gumi and autumn olive autumn berry um as far as I know, that's all the Eliagnus we, we grow um, besides sea berry. Um, yeah. But you so know, we, do, does... we do a lot of other berries like Aroni and stuff that are really vigorous, but none are, I don't think any others are Eliagnus. But so the, the Gumi does all right um, in your climate? It it's, has died back hard on two, at, in the last 15 years, when we, as our span of testing Gumi, um, it's died back to the ground twice, but it's never died. Right. Whereas like medlar has died, you know, we like, we don't plant medlar anymore. Like they died, they never came back. Yeah. All right, we're not gonna necessarily try those again. Um, I didn't even like those really. I, yeah, I, I like medlar are like... weird, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know. you know, we try to grow everything, at least yeah. a, a, a version of everything just to have as the, a diversity cell as like a, you know, botanical resource, but um, yeah, medlar died, quince died to the ground, never came oh, wow. and oh, never my. came back. Yeah, um, but it was in a tough spot too. I mean, really, we should keep trying all of it, and we we do generally. Like persimmon has been a huge stretch for us. We planted persimmon over and over again. I've gotten persimmon from various sources, and finally, it's kind of taking on our original site, which is warmer than our other site, um, but it's it's in the mountains of central Vermont. It's, you know, it's really on edge. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I guess we're a little warmer than you. Um, we're like more like five a. Yeah. 
I'm I'm trying all that too. You know, I'm growing a bunch of persimmon. Uh, I'm yeah, my I would think cross for persimmons you. could do it where you are. I yeah, I hope so. I, yeah, I've got like the oikos uh, seed stock and some mm-hmm. from twisted tree and uh, very and trying the like proc and early golden and stuff like uh-huh. that. Cool. Uh, we'll we'll see. That's my favorite fruit I know. of all time. They're though. so <laughs> yummy. Yeah, I can't even say I barely ever had them. Uh, Sean Dembrowski and I taste some. I taste some with him. He harvests a bunch. You know, you know, in the Ithaca area, they they actually mm-hmm. grow. You know, they're around there. Mm-hmm. Um, at least a little bit here. Um, you know, there's a there's some reportedly in Vermont, but yeah, it's something I've barely tasted. Mm. Yeah, I've, I've mostly tasted them in like like driving through. We drove through Missouri at just the right time. It was oh like, my gosh, it was dangerous to drive with him. He was like, oh, persimmons. He's like driving off the road. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, focus. <laughs> but we got some. Yeah. They were just so delicious. They're like candy. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, any fruit that keeps to um, on right. the tree through the winter is just immense value for wildlife. Yeah. So. Totally. We we focus on this thing I call turkey apple, which is just an ornamental crab. I graft them on wild trees all over the place. I'll gorilla graft them on other properties. I'll do it here and all the edges. Cool. Um, and just because they keep in the winter. So it's a massive, I call it turkey apple because the turkeys for one really, you know, feast on it. Cool. But yeah, anything that keeps in the winter that store that keeps on the tree is of huge value. And anything that bears really reliable. Mm. that's the thing with a lot of fruits i mean especially tree fruits they're just not very reliable in this part of the world yeah and yeah. nuts i mean you know they tend to come and go i mean black walnut's been pretty reliable for us but um you know apples are on and off they're not mm-hmm. they're not really every year big pears maybe a little more consistent walnuts okay chestnuts kind of obviously oaks you know on and off um so a lot of the stuff, you know, does it and then doesn't. And we also don't have as much tree fruit, whereas shrubs tend to be much more reliable. Okay. Yeah. Year to yeah, year. That, that's another reason f- for high diversity too. <laughs> yeah. You know, one year, your apples are going gangbusters and the next your pears. And yeah, we've never along. had black currant have a bad year. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and probably like that, do, you, do you do a lot of blueberries or. Yeah. Yeah. We do enough to gorge, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> Nice. but yeah but uh you know they, they I, most of the berries are pretty reliable i mean there's either you know sometimes there's bonkers blackberry years like this year was an amazing blackberry summer i mean they're really drought tolerant we've moved into like a droughty regime you know despite all the models were saying we were gonna um get what more northeast was gonna get warmer and wetter our summers have you know kind of dried up oh, like quite a bit yeah on the whole and that's really affecting things well, you're also pretty high on the mountain, right? Yeah, I mean, we're at like 15, 1,600 feet, 15 to 1,600. Okay. So, you know, that's not too high. Although in New England, that actually, like, is a lot higher than even 800. That's, like, a big difference. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're at, like, 1,200, but we're kind of mm-hmm. just on, like, the the hill, foothills. Yeah, yeah. Um, but w- I guess, would, would you like to tell our listeners a little bit about your homestead and your sites, mm-hmm. uh, if they're not familiar? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, they're just kind of mountain, you know, mountain homesteads and farms. Um, although our original site really doesn't have any farmland on it. You know, there's no real ag soil to speak of. It's like a bouldery, poor hillside. It wasn't really um, farmed except for sheep, you know, which okay. most of New England was a sheep pasture in the 1800s. Um, yeah, and we just grow as many, you know, we're just, it's, they're research oriented and we're just trying to grow as much diversity as possible um, to set in motion um, systems that hopefully can thrive for hundreds of years and other people can take on in the future and be, you know, working through the intricacies of which, what apple varieties do really well here. And I'm just like in the phase of just, well, let's just grow hundreds of apple varieties first, <laughs> just to, just to have that possibility. Right. Probably who knows how long I live, but by the time I go, you know, I'll just be maybe starting to, to tweak some of it, but mostly the game, the game of my life will just be to get the species established and a lot of varieties. And then there'll be lifetimes of figuring out oh this variety of this berry is actually really good in mead with 
these three things, you know, but they'll all have to figure that out. You know, I'm just trying to get the possibilities in the ground. Yeah. So, um, yeah, lots of diversity. And, um, and then we teach courses, you know, people come here to learn. And then we also are able to work with clients doing design and consulting by leveraging what we've learned by doing it. Right. So, um, you know, early on in permaculture, my first few years, I just realized how many things that were in books that made sense in books don't work on the site. <laughs> Yeah. And so I was like, oh, okay, I better just do it for a while before teaching or before sharing much about it. So like we didn't offer a permaculture course until we had been on the original site for like getting towards like, I think it was eight years because it was just like there were still just the learning curve is still so steep. Yeah, you know, I remember making putting chickens under fruit trees because they'll eat the drops and then break the pest cycles. Like, yeah, that sounds great except they didn't mention well if you put them under young fruit trees they jump up in the branches and just rip the branches down and just (laughs) completely wreck the tree and it was like oh okay you know i'm not saying chickens under apples or under fruits are a bad idea but there's just so much it depends there's so much it's all context dependent and so you just gotta learn how to do it on your own site you know well that's the other thing it depends on on your site and even if something in a, in a book might make sense in one context, in another climate, even on another side of the valley, it might be different. Totally. I mean, developing our second site made me realize that like Swales, for instance, is a much drier site, our second site, and it's sandy versus clay, clay on our, the original site. And despite what a lot of people think of Swales as a water catching feature, we made them to get above the water and actually... Uh-huh. It creates a drier regime on top of the swale. And a lot of the stuff is too droughted out on top of the swale on our second site. So some of them, you know, I probably wouldn't have done if I did it again, uh, knowing what I know now. But I had to kind of work with these two sites for years to see the differences. And they're, you know, they're 20 miles apart. Yeah. I mean, yeah. pretty much the same climate. Um, right. But different soils, different aspect. And that can change everything. Yeah. So one of the other things that is, speaking of changes and differences in climate, I mean, is that this global weirding is happening and you don't even know what's going to be, what your climate is necessarily going to be like in five, 10, 15, 50 years. Um, How have you seen that over the, over your tenure in Vermont? And what what do you kind of see as the, as happening in the future with, with this global weirding? Yeah. Well, like I said, I think that the drought regime, you know, we had our most serious drought that's happened here in decades, three summers ago. That was very for real. Didn't really rain for most of the growing season, much of significance. And then in the three to four years since, um, it's been reminiscent of that. Not quite as hardcore, but, you know, we'll go. I think it was even, was it this summer, the last summer we went you know, maybe two months where we had some rain and by the rain gauge, we were kind of normal. Actually, this summer was like that, this last summer. By the numbers, and I kept a rain gauge, we, we had, we had no, almost normal rain, but the regime and the, of the way the rain came, it was always in very small events. So it never got into the soil. Uh-huh. Mm. So I would look out after, you know, we'd get a 10th of an inch and the, it wouldn't even have gotten through the mulching. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. you know, it depends how you get the, the moisture too. And we just weren't getting real storms. And um, so even though it was normal, you know, and I think the meteorologists and the weather reports were like, oh, it was pretty normal. It was like, well, it's not normal in the sense that we got, we got them in so, so sporadically and in such small amounts that um, they weren't really watering the plants, the, the rain events we did have. So what I'm finding is just, you know, we just have to buffer the moisture more and more, um, like mulching, which is a lot of work, especially for established yeah. plants. I'm doing a lot with ram pumps and like storing water up on hills. And actually, I put my whole sea, part of my seabury orchard on drip a few years ago, oh, which wow. is like, man, that's like never, I've never put any perennial plants on irrigation except one little line of blueberries. Mm. Um, and it's like, that's like what you have to do out west, you know, like yeah. use, use plastic to, 
and water like a perennial berry bush like we've never had to do that here Hmm. um and you know would they have all died without that no but some would have and I went to you know I'm invested in that plant so I really wanted them to thrive so I put a bunch of inputs you know in drip irrigation into it um I'm storing water up on the hill and then gravity feeding it down to water some stuff. But yeah, we water our veggie garden a lot more than we used to. Um, you know, it's the diver- diversity is obviously the big thing and, and water systems, water catchment, storage and distribution. Yeah, that's so super important. It kind um, of, I think our systems here might end up having to look like more of the typical out West permaculture sites where you're catching mm-hmm winter water and trying to store it as long through the summer as you can and then some some years maybe that's not necessary we'll get like really good rain but i'm not i'm not planning on it yeah Mm -hmm. well you're planning for the lack of it rather is is yeah planning on the lack of it totally i mean right better to plan for the lack of it anyways and get essentially large ponds in place that you can gravity feed water from um yeah. Ideally. So do you have any, I know this could be like, it's a whole hour long episode in itself about ponds and water yeah. and things like that, but do you have any initial um, insights on where to place a pond if somebody has a piece of property that they're looking to invest in a pond? Yeah. I mean, well, there's a lot to that. You know, you got to take into account the watershed that's above it if you're trying to feed it from above although you can use ponds as reservoirs, like I'm describing, and then you just need a place where you can uh, have a, a, a mellow enough landform, a, a low angle enough slope where you can actually get some catchment into the ground mm-hmm. versus, you know, on the steeper slope, the more, the more difficult it is to store, to create a, 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 an impoundment because mm. just geometrically. So you're always looking for a little bit of flat ground or a little bit of lower angle ground in a larger slope that might be steeper. And then you're looking to put them in places where the, ideally you could gravity feed from. So ideally it's above zone one yeah. on mm-hmm. a typical homestead, I think would be one way to put it, but it could just be above you know, some commercially viable or you know, really important area that might be in zone two or zone three, whether it's animals, livestock, like we have five cows now that I, I want to be able to get water to um, and not always have them very low down on the property. Because a lot of properties will always have plenty of water down low, but you want to be able to use, utilize up higher where there's a lot less water. Mm. Right. Um, so there's a lot to consider. And then the soils, of course, you know, if you want to be able to store water without a line, without buying a liner, which is always, of course, better. But we've done line ponds in a variety of ways, and, and that's viable too. Mm-hmm. Whether it's clay, bringing in clay, or using like a polyethylene or EPDM liner. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but that's EPDM. only the second best. You want to yeah. have the soils ideal. Yeah. Like I, I feel like EPDM is good for small ponds. Yeah. A place that you, maybe the if, if you have really sandy soil or something. But mm-hmm. you know, if that's all you can do, then it's better than nothing. Yeah, and I mean, you can store a meaningful amount of water in a in a small EPDM line pond. That's essentially a cistern. Yeah, you know, once you get above, really only a few thousand gallons, it's pretty quickly much more economical to store water in a pond than in tanks. Yeah, or it could even be less than a few thousand gallons, depending on right where you get tanks and 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 how you can store water. Yeah, and like having them not freeze and <laughs> or break. Oh well, like if you're doing like. IBC totes or something, you know, those, those yeah. reason break. Um, right. Yeah. We use IBC totes, but just seasonally, just for, just in the summer, mm-hmm. just draining so the other, that <laughs> fall. Yeah. Uh, well, the other thing about ponds is uh, they can be extremely expensive uh, mm-hmm. to, to make happen. I mean, um, many thousands of dollars. So do you have yeah. any, like, how, how do you go about that? Well, yeah, they can be. I mean, if you have the soils, like if you have really good soils on site, um, you could dig a pretty big pond with a bulldozer in a day or two days, shaped and everything. And, you know, a a bulldozer, a full-size bulldozer, you know, like a 20,000 pound dozer, that's a big dozer, even 15,000 pound dozer. Um, 
or a full size excavator, 30,000 pound excavator, nothing crazy big, but full size figure a thousand dollars a day, depending where you are without right. delivery. Um, so, you know, you could be looking at a pretty nice impoundment with tens of thousands of gallons, even a hundred thousand gallons for a couple few thousand dollars if you have the right soils and the right slope. So that's yeah. actually really cheap compared to buying containers of anything. Sure. Uh, Very tanks. Cheap. But it's pretty easy to start spending more than that too when you get into piping and, and surveying and um, seeding and finishing the finish grading and you know any areas around the pond and any in material inputs, whether it's sand or clay. I mean, if you have to start buying clay, you know, immediately you're going to spend a couple thousand dollars or more on that. Yeah. Because a dump truck of clay doesn't go too far in a pond. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you figure at least four or five, six hundred dollars to get a dump truck to your site nowadays of, of really anything, mm -hmm. depending where you are, even if the material essentially is a waste product. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those good soils, usually like the heavy clay soils for, for a pond, um, they're usually in the valley area. Or is in, it in, in valley shapes in, yeah. on the site? Yeah. They're, they're not necessarily, I mean, they're more like in, um, placed in the larger landscape according to, you know, the last glaciation, the forces, uh -huh. you know, that geologic forces and, and glacier impacts, you know, when the, Holocene, you know, the last ice sheet ended. So, um, so generally, like where I, and that varies from place to place, but generally lower in the landscape, you tend to have more clays on site. Mm -hmm. And as you get higher, you tend to have less clays. That's probably a pretty basic rule. And then in river, in river bottoms, you know, you tend to be sandy. So, mm -hmm. which is a very clear exception to that. Um, but it really just depends where you are. You know, where I am in Vermont, there's old, you know, ancient seas, and they determined really where the clays uh, went. Um, so there can be some upland clays, and then the whole big bottom of the Champlain Valley, for instance, is clay, basically, because that was all a seabed bottom. So it really varies from site to, it, you know, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, and it can be a little hard to predict, but soil maps tend to be incredibly accurate for this stuff. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, um, but you'll tend to definitely, they tend to sell out on lower angle slopes. So yeah, that much is usually the case. Although there's a, a lot of exceptions to that too. And it, it seems like it really is a good investment if we're heading towards a time of variability in moisture uh, when it's just so important, important for every aspect of- Yeah. I mean, it's hard to get around the, the value of storing water for sure and storing as much water as you can and as high as you can, but that's also challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure. in, in a site like our second site, we have a lot of water down low and very little water up high. It's sandy, but there's so much water down low. That's where ramp pumps are incredible. And we've worked with two different ramp pumps and we can send, you know, that I can send, uh, I can fill five IBC totes in two and a half days with no electricity, with just a ram pump going 24 seven, click, 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 click. And five IBC totes fill like 50 feet above zone one. That's amazing. Yeah, those ram yeah. pumps are super ram pumps cool. so cool. They're amazing. I mean, they're unbelievable. You know, I'd studied, I started, I heard of them maybe in college, you know, like 20 some odd years ago. I was like, wow, that's amazing. You know, note to self, like remember to do a ram pump someday. And then I <laughs> had to, the situation until we were developing our second site and I just bought a cheap one online and until you see them work you know you don't really believe it's possible right yeah I've seen them out out west mm -hmm. um you know like it's it's you know very important out there yeah <laughs> yeah have the water yeah yeah like pumps up a hill at our friend's property from a spring that's like way down mm -hmm. at the bottom and just pumps right up the hill to their yeah. garden yeah, if you have an excess of water low down, and that's where impoundments down low on the property, as long as you uh, have, you know, call it five to 10 feet drop or more below the impoundment, then, well, you can just send that water back uphill. Yeah. One thing I didn't realize, and I'm still figuring out with the two ramp pumps I have, is you need a certain amount of, of, of height to pump up. Like you can't mm -hmm. pump up just a little bit. Like the ramp pump doesn't mm -hmm. want to work without a certain amount of back pressure. 
I see. Which is totally weird, but that's just how it works. You'd think, oh, well, you just get more water. Like if I'm asking the ramp pump to pump 20 feet up instead of 60, well, I'll just maybe get three times as much water at 20 than at 60. But it's like, no, it might not. Sometimes they won't, they just won't work at a lower wow. head. I mean, you could always turn a valve like mostly closed and, and kind of artificially induced back pressure, but it's just, they're really weird. Huh. Yeah. yeah and I don't know enough about the physics to, to know <laughs> just why that is exactly. I mean, I kind of have a sense of why that is, but it's be hard to explain, but it's just, they're weird. So yeah. we get our RAM pump that we've run for a few years now uh, runs on a 25 foot drop, 20 to 25. And it sends water up like 90. Wow. That's and it, so and amazing. It'll fill, it'll fill five IBC totes in about two and a half days. Yeah. You so go out cool. there and, you know, you go out there in the middle of the night, you know, 10 o'clock at night, it's totally dark. Things pump water's pouring out the end. You're like, there's no sun, you know, it was like, where's the energy coming from? You know? Yeah. yeah. Falling water. So it's just, yeah. yeah. Water, a water, water hammer, you know, mm -hmm. so they're, they're neat. And then we, I got a three inch ramp pump, which is a beast. Um, on craigslist and it happened to be for sale in my town nice. wow. and i haven't hooked it up yet we're about to but that's gonna that supposedly will pump uh like 15 to 20 gallons a minute whoa which is wow. like that's like three house hose bibs on full blast yeah well you need the you need the that much yeah, water got, yeah. right so it's taking three inches of water which is like 90 well, gallons a minute. yeah wow. and it's yeah, using I mean, more than that too right to because it's using the, the flow of the water coming down to pump it back up. So right. a lot of the water's flowing past it. Yeah, yeah. But no, this will take a three inch, except the three inch input. And so yeah. that's like 80, 90 gallons a minute, depending that's on crazy. what table you look at, <laughs> which is like fire hose, you know, like that'll drain the pond we're taking from very quickly. So this would be just an intermittent, whereas the other ramp up will turn on and run for like half the summer uh -huh. because we have enough water this one would be like all right we're going to run it for three hours and if we keep it on and forget it's on like the pond will be like a lot lower the next day you know it yeah. it, it, it would burn through the pond pretty quick because that's three inches of water yeah so but we'll probably just run it for two hours and the ibc totes will be full and you know mm -hmm. really quickly so. that's so cool talk about talk about appropriate tech you know that's just yeah that's what that's what yeah. we really need for the future <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah. I've heard I heard a story of someone was hiking along in um, California somewhere in the mountains and they heard like a noise and they stopped and like what's that sound and they're in the middle of nowhere and and they heard like a clicking noise and um, they like start digging around and like move move some earth so uh, uh, leaves back and they there was a ramp pump underground running that was <laughs> forgotten about oh wow really? like it had been there like <laughs> decades <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're, I forget where I read this. And they're like, yeah, I mean, like no one had done anything in this area in like recent history, basically. Yeah. Maybe it was a secret <laughs> weed grow or something. Yeah. But still, that, that I, I believe it, you know? That's, yeah, until they wear themselves out. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. So water is definitely one of them, but I was um, wanted to ask you, what are some of the essential elements of a uh, functioning homestead? So... Well, ponds and the I rain mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just really hierarchy of needs, right? You know, food, clothing, shelter, mm -hmm. heat, heat, energy, although energy is at a gradient. I mean, you don't really need electricity as much as you need heat, although good luck living without some electricity in today's world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, infrastructure is a big one that's just, I think, very underutilized. I, I think a lot of, I see a lot of people doing homesteading and having like amazing gardens and maybe all sorts of stuff going on, tons of animal systems. And they like don't have an, they don't have a well insulated home. Like the home wasn't really considered often usually because they didn't build it. And so that's understandable. Like most, there's very few like good homes for sale. Um, but I think that's a big one that I see people really just, you know, will be surprisingly um, lack of, have a lack of focus on compared to like, if you can really insulate your home well and get it dialed with a wood stove um, and create a resilient, you know, home infrastructure, that's, that's pretty baseline. That, that often gets the short shrift and what I, and a lot, what a lot of what I see in permaculture too, I see in the permaculture world, just not a lot of focus on like the permaculture home. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, you know, there's, there's all the basics, water storage, good tooling skills, of course, are you know, <laughs> skills, skills are a big one. They're the only one you can take with you really. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, I came into this world from growing up in the suburbs of Rochester, New York. So I didn't really, I didn't grow up learning a lot of the skills. Like my son was working with me on my sawmill today and has in the past and you know he's five i mean i don't let him do you know obviously a lot of things with it but <laughs> he's you know he's growing up with an exposure that you know i i haven't got i didn't get until i was in my 20s yeah right. um so yeah i see it know, with our Amish and... neighbors they just like they know how to do so many things by the time they're 16 yeah, yeah. i'll never learn how to do <laughs> yeah yeah and it's just it just shows you, you know, what we focus on. I mean, I went to college, yeah. I even went to grad school and, and I delayed learning a lot of basic skills until later in life. I have a friend who's like a full on licensed plumber, licensed electrician, knows his way around any, you know, any physical thing you can ask him questions. I mean, he's like a, a certified welder, all this stuff. I remember one day I was like, how'd you, how'd you learn all these hard skills? So you kind of, he ran a sawmill for a living for a little while. I'm like, wow, wow. You know about all, all I, I mean I, I, the more i hang out with the more i'm like oh yeah he knows about that too and you're like <laughs> how have you learned that much you know trades like how you know essentially you can kind of know every trade at least pretty well if not really well and um he's like well i never went to college dude like yeah I'm like oh yeah he's like you know you spent like seven you know six years on that stuff <laughs> like, um. and it's like okay yeah that was six years you know um but yeah, it's in kind of what you focus on, you know. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm sure I know how know how to lot, know how to do a lot of things that my Amish neighbors don't know how to do. Also, right, right, so, right. Here's the give and take. Yeah, but it it is you know we all only have the same 24 hours in a day, and um, yeah, it's kind of like just where do we focus? And I mean, I've learned a lot in the last 20 25 years since I started getting on land, but um. You know, I, I do think my son, by the time my son's 15 to 20, I think he'll be where I'm at now with most mm -hmm. of, with most of my skills, um, which is pretty cool to think of like, wow, then, then where he, could he go with it? You know? Yeah. 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 There is, there is just 24 hours in a day and it seems like there's always so much to do and it's, it's hard to like not run yourself ragged when you're doing farming and homesteading and, you know, trying to live this lifestyle yeah it's not the simple life <laughs> right <laughs> yeah right. people call i know why people call it that but it's definitely there's nothing really more simple about it than uh with the more modern uh popular lifestyle yeah mm -hmm. just go to the office come back you got the tv yeah got your, yeah. your heat pump pipes to you or just press the knob yeah all the things <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's but it's 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 definitely more hands-on it's a lot more fulfilling for a lot of us but uh yeah, yeah it's, it, but burnout i mean burnout and, and managing it all seems to be about the biggest challenge most people face mm -hmm. i love hearing about like systems of making it easier mm -hmm. and i think like your sort of philosophy in general of of home setting where you're designing like a highly forageable landscape rather than the annual crops, which annual fruit and veggie production is like so demanding, mm -hmm. you know, but you're creating a system where you can walk out and kind of forage, see what's available at that mm -hmm. time and store it. Yeah. And I mean, that takes, um, that takes space, which for right. a lot of us, you know, time is our limiting factor for most people, but space may or may not be. For us, space is not as much of a limiting factor as it is for some people. So I right. think, you know, I think the classic peasant homestead where the garden is like the main engine food system wise of the yeah. site is still a really good idea. And I mean, I say that as a permaculture guy, like, you know, whose focus is perennial plants, but I still, you know, want to make a nod to like your annual garden is really a a, a baseline part of your food system unless mm -hmm. you're i don't know way on a whole nother level you know I, <laughs> I still think so much food comes out of that garden yeah and um it is like a opportunity to just turn your raw sweat into like 
bushels of potatoes yes. that you can definitely live on if you need to. Yes. Um, just by your toil in the soil. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as you can scrounge up some nitrogen. But right. um, so, but yeah, it, it, I've tried to, at a more extensive level, just promote a, a forageable ecosystem where we can just harvest too without a ton of work. Still get a lot of food out of the garden, the veggie garden. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we, and we have our annual garden too, and it's it is very important, and it's a lot more resilient in some ways, um, because when you have your apples yeah. fail or right. your pears fail or or, or whatever, um, mm-hmm. you can get potatoes probably. <laughs> yeah, get your greens, um, mm-hmm. but the perennial systems are also very amazing, and I've always kind of looked at it the, the way of a forgeable. You're creating a, a forgeable ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, yeah you know, designing that rather than i don't know sometimes in permaculture it's more about like a having everything like perfectly managed more mm-hmm. landscape design it's still landscape design i guess mm-hmm. uh, but yeah and pretty quickly it becomes like just a berry farm like a berry farm right. like a, like okay yeah. well like yeah i've seen this before it's like you can go to the pick your own and like <laughs> right yeah <laughs> they can call that, i guess that's a permaculture if it's organic you know at mm-hmm. some point it's not really much different yeah yeah well what does what what makes it a, a permaculture farm in your opinion <laughs> oh, i was hoping you wouldn't ask that <laughs> um you know i think there's a lot of different aspects to it i mean i yeah. think a lot of stuff is permaculture that that no one calls permaculture mm-hmm. so i would start by saying that i don't i don't think it should be um i don't think it's some special elusive thing that only the people who have had the certification or whatever else read the books um are doing like tons of people forever have been doing permaculture who never heard the term right so just to get that out of the way like at the beginning Mm -hmm. um and to me i think of it being permaculture if it's generally a regenerative on the net on the whole enterprise mm-hmm. where the place is being left better than than it was the year before the year before the year before and the humans that are there are essentially endeavoring to live on the interest yield the the, the current yield year to year to year of the system um and they're not mining you know they're not mining the system Mm. mining the principle of the system so that's just a regenerative definition now of course there's all the permaculture principles and you know one could say well it's not permaculture if it doesn't abide by the by the three ethics the primary Mm. ethics of of permaculture earth care people care return of the surplus you know if you're not doing those things then it's not permaculture and yeah that you know maybe that's true too um there's a lot of ways to interpret those yeah three things but i I do think that's a good thing too yeah i mean for sure like those three um ethics you know if if one is is just doesn't care about one of them well then maybe it isn't permaculture but i take a little more of a functionalist view whereas where it's if you're participating as a beneficial member of your ecosystem and you're trying to what you're doing is trying to promote the health of that ecosystem and live on its on its yields on its side um spin-offs to that system then then there's permaculture happening um whether you've heard the word or not you know i've yeah. traveled in some areas of the world and seen all sorts of amazing you know what i would call permaculture peasant living situations and you know of course where the people haven't heard the term um and certainly can still be permaculture so it's almost in a way like pretty much most uh, farming techniques or farming systems before industrial agriculture c- could be looked at. I mean, there's still some mining, agricultural mining going on mm-hmm. in a lot of places, but generally like before uh, all this cheap, abundant fossil fuels, you had to <laughs> live in a regenerative way or you weren't going to be living. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that's largely true. I mean, you could say you could look at like even slash and burn, you know, Sweden Mm -hmm. agriculture and a lot of, you know, um, you know, indigenous systems where even if the system was maybe denuded a little bit in this one acre, 
uh, on the whole, by moving often, the whole region wasn't denuded. Right. Yeah. You know, um, and R- you got to look at that. Yeah. yeah. You got to look at the whole, the whole thing. I mean, um, that's where, you know, I get a, a little like sometimes miffed when I, I hear people say like, well, what we're doing is beneficial for all. And it's like, well, there's always a cost. I mean, I can always tell mm. you every year there's one part of my site that I'm taking from. Right. And it's uh, and it's going to be a little worse off. But the goal is the whole site is better off. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I mean, I just dropped a bunch of trees, you know, the last few weeks. And that part of the site, I don't think I improved per se immediately, you know, maybe in the long run. But I took from that part of the site. So then I'm not getting firewood from somewhere farther away. Right. Um, and I'm, you know, beating on the area where the cows are overwintered. And that area of the site is not better off. But then I have a mountain of compost to lay yeah. down and improve much more area than that one area that got beat up. Right. Yeah. I mean, heck, I'm having the tree uh, arborists that are in the area clearing power lines drive in over part of an acre and dump wood chips so I can benefit a lot of the site, but that area they drove over is not benefit, you know? Sure. Yeah. So I kind of want to, you know, just, there's a little soapbox there to get on. Like, there's just this idea of we benefit all. It's like, well, hold on. All is a lot of, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> right. that's kind of everything. And like, I don't <laughs> know. I mean, I'm not, yeah. Like I'm not, uh, that's a little, little bold to say. I yeah. mean. Well, you can't have your annual garden being the productive engine that it that should be if you don't have it usually an animal like waste compost right. to input into it and that where is the food from that animal coming like you know, are they right. grazing where you getting the hay you know there's there's a whole right, <laughs> right. But i think that's what for me that's what permaculture really means is looking at the whole system right I think. right and there's all scales to look at i mean we can yeah. look at it the the, at the earth level we can look at it at the you know continental level at the, the local community level regional we can look at it at the site level or the watershed level um yeah but they're all they're all the, we have to look at that whole um yeah it's easy to i mean i like to always fall back on the wendell berry you know dictum of like we use we're here we're, we're we are we are using to to be here mm-hmm. and so it's about responsible use it's not about pretending some way that we don't use you know i mean i was a practicing vegan through college and i don't know how much i was bought into the idea that i didn't use but i've seen that a lot in veganism uh where it's like well i don't you know i no one nothing has to die for me and it's like whoa okay but it actually really doesn't true. really work that way yeah. yeah yeah it's it's pick who dies and and where and how but we don't, we don't get out of this without killing, you know, I mean, unfortunately, I've said that and some people say, oh, it's not unfortunate. That's the cycle of life. But I, I mean, it would be cool if like that could be reality, but I just don't think it is. It's, it's all about, let's just be responsible for our use. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really crucial bit there. Mm-hmm. Um, so to go, to look at, I guess, <laughs> to go back to the future, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, we have this global weirding going on. We have, I mean, from my perspective, uh, peak oil makes sense. Like we're going to have less energy in the future, Yeah. even with, um, you know, solar and wind and water, <laughs> you know, cause like water is running all the time uh, with like the ramp pumps. Um, and even using those like in a more decentralized way, which I think mm-hmm. would be better. Uh, we're going to still have less energy yeah. in the future than we currently do. <laughs> so yeah. what, what do you see as, uh, as the future from your perspective? And um, are you, are you, is, are all these things that you're doing moving you towards a more resilient future for yourself and your community? Um, or like, what, what do you think people should be doing uh, yeah. with that future in mind? Yeah, well, I, I couldn't agree more that, I mean, I think energy descent is, you know, the the lot we've been, we're inheriting, we're inheriting a time of energy descent, probably, you know, none of us have a crystal ball, but I think right. like the way right. David David Holmgren has laid it out really well in his work of, of, of 
just articulating what energy descent means and what it looks like and how we can kind of, you know, maybe hopefully graciously or gracefully adapt to that gearing down um, and realizing, okay, we don't need, like I was just hearing the other day, we, we basically, each of us who taps into fossil fuels harnesses a hundred other humans in labor via fossil fuel. Like we have a hundred labor right. units at our disposal. You know, when I fire up my chainsaw, I'm applying, you know, millions of year old distilled energy to the cut, to the kerf and flinging chips out of that kerf in five seconds to, to do riding on the backs of millions of years of sunshine coming into the planet distilled in this material that then got processed and somehow I got it in this machine. <laughs> And it's like a lightsaber. I'm just applying it to this surgical activity. And it's great. You know, it's amazing. You went, if you just go back barely three, four generations, you'd just be a god with a chain, you know. <laughs> if you had a screw gun or a chainsaw, you're just like, you know, we're not worthy. Like, where did you, what planet did you come from? You know, I mean, that, that level of power is just insane. So I think our, I like to, figure and bank on that are our, our um you know we're going to be ancestors to people our descendants are going to hold are going to hold us to account for having that level of power um yeah. and and or at least i i want to be able to um feel like that power was used wisely and you know for my own descendants not just my own single child but just that that that's a basic way to try to be a decent person now uh, for those who come after us because we just have so much power just by literally a five gallon jug going down to the gas station you know it's just the power of gods mm -hmm. and um, there are scenarios where we'll have that much power for a long time but it's not safe to bank on those scenarios Right. Even if that might like, so that might happen. Like I have, you know, cornucopian technologist friends of mine are like, oh, that's crazy. You think we're going to have energy descent. We're going to just figure the next thing out and there'll be yeah. fusion or whatever. It's like, okay, you might be right. I think you're not, but <laughs> which one is safe to bank on? Yeah. Yeah. Because the fact is we can live really well without that much energy. Yeah. So why? And there's and even if we can find that much energy, that's a huge cost. And we're probably just going to do bullshit with it anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, so like, <laughs> I kind of hope it doesn't happen also, because just because we're not going to do good things with it on, on the whole. Mm -hmm. So I kind of hope for energy descent too, in a lot of ways, because, yeah, yeah because it's like, look what we do with, it, you know, when we have it. So, um, so yeah, I, I try to bank on it and, and, um, you know, get systems in place. I mean, that's why I'm trying to plant these places out, develop, you know, really durable long-term infrastructure. If I can spend a little more money or a little more time now when I'm like building a cow shed, oh, okay, wait, can I just spend a little more time and energy now to make this foundation last instead of 20 years, a hundred years? Because uh -huh. in 20 years, me fixing this cow shed might be a different ball of wax that's than, fix, than doing this right now. Like it might take me an hour extra and an extra hundred dollars to make that go another 80 years. And in, in those 80, in that 80 year period of time, there might be some real stuff that the people who live here need to deal with. That's not just fixing this falling down cow shed. Like they need to get calories, yeah, you yeah. know, and get ready for winter. And so, um, because, you know, as energy um, gets less, I mean, this shit will get real. You know, I mean, getting ready for the winter won't be, you know, will be very serious endeavor, you know, um, yeah. and, and it's hard to, you know, really imagine that right now. Um, although when you read about it, you just look back in history and it's not actually that hard because, you know, I've read stories where even in Vermont in May, which is when spring really came around off in late April and by like mid-May when people are all in the villages after a few weeks and they realize oh I never saw so-and-so I was like oh like okay like he didn't make it through the winter like we better go hike up to his house and you know he's gonna be dead up there you know like like people didn't just wow. make it through the winter you know and that yeah. was a commonality you know in 
rural New England just not even that long ago. Mm -hmm. um, the winters were harsher, and but the energy was more scarce is why it was. Um, so yeah, I, I think just to kind of get right at your question, I, I think it's, it's really all about that. How do we gear ourselves um, to be ready uh, and, and able to weather an energy descent future in a, in a good way? And also, you know, I feel like what I'm doing now isn't detracting from my life to do, to endeavor in that. It's actually usually a really meaningful thing. Yeah. yeah, you're gonna have a better life now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, there's an, you know, there are some preps, so to speak, preparations which could be looked at as like not fun, expensive slash hoarding slash not helping <laughs> other people, and there are certainly those like buying lots of firearms would be a good example. Right. Not necessarily saying I recommend that, but most of what we can do to prepare ourselves and our communities to be better situated for an energy descent future also improves our own personal lives and our community connections and our community lives now. Yeah. And so then it's like, well, what, just what makes the most sense to bank on, you know, what, what's best to believe might happen in the future, mm -hmm. you know, because if you believe, Oh, there'll just be more energy. We'll figure it out. Techno cornucopian view. It's like, well, what are you, how's that really going to, what are you going to do to improve your life with that belief? <laughs> like, yeah. what do you do with that? You know? Yeah, it, it does seem like any view you have about the past or the future, um, really when it comes down to it, it's, it's about how it affects your life in the present. Right. Like how it motivates your actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think there are so many things that can improve our lives now and help us be good ancestors. Yeah. I feel There's like ponds, plants, ponds is one of them. <laughs> ponds, planting yeah. trees, planting yeah. food trees, planting food shrubs, build whatever you need to build soil, saving seeds, sharing information and, and skills and knowledge. But, you mm -hmm. know, there's there's already more lifetimes worth of those things than any of us will ever have time to do enough. Yeah. So to me, it seems like well, we might as well just do you know focus on that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I do feel like, I mean, I came across the idea of degrowth in college, you know, 20 some odd years ago, and now more than ever feel like I think those ideas are still really sound. Like I just read a bunch of Peter, uh, Peter Zine. He's like a, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, just he's pretty well known on this, but a lot of just energy descent future. I mean, um, Christopher Martinson and, and David Holmgren and Nate Hagens and just people talking about you know, how we're going to be energy limited and really how we're at uh, the age of like deglobalization. Yeah. 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 You know, Peter Zine, I guess, says 2019 was like, we'll be looked back on as the high watermark for like a functional global connected um, economy. Right. And in that context, you know, buying stuff from, <laughs> from Walmart that came from Australia, that came from New Zealand, you know, South America and so on might have made sense in a certain way, but it does seem like right now what makes sense is building local community and doing, doing these things, De preparing now for the decent decentralized future. Yeah. Yeah. The transition, you know, transition lifestyles. I mean, I like the transition town movement kind of faded away, but that was, that was the idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was the idea. I don't know where it went because that was I remember when that came around that was like yes this is it this is beyond like permaculture beyond like recycling and stuff that preceded it I was like yes this transition town movement is and it still is to me like a great idea it was just the, the the formal movement of that seemed to just kind of fade off like I don't even hear yeah. the term anymore mm -hmm. well it can be hard sometimes uh to force things you know like I think mm -hmm. some of the best best relationships are organic in a certain way. Um, and like, uh, th that's another reason why like, um, co co communes fold so much, like mm -hmm. most communes. Personal relations. Yeah. Well, no, like a commune, like an intentional community. Yeah. Most yeah. of them fold within the first year or two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's when things are imposed from the outside in or yeah. top down, it's just, they don't tend to work. I mean, but it's interesting to see when people are able to do it. Like you mentioned the Amish, I joke with friends, yeah. I'm like, man, like 
can you just join the Amish? Cause like that might be <laughs> the best option here, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I know I'm sure there's plenty of problems. I don't want to like hold it up on a pedestal, but you know, that the community piece, so many people are struggling to, to facilitate. And, and, you know, you look at how many groups of people can be like, I'm building a barn, like 50 people show up, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. till it's done. Yeah. That's, that's real power. Mm-hmm really Plus is they, it's amazing that they all know how to live without electricity <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah i mean they've they've got and in the the covid time i mean there was a cool little like quick it was pretty mainstream actually a clip on on amish folks dealing with covid and they interviewed yeah. one guy and he was like oh well you know the the mandates and the different guidelines we're going to we're we were looking at them we're like oh maybe we'll do them because we don't want to spread the virus around but then they're like oh we realized it was going to change our culture and and we weren't going to do that so we didn't do that and i remember i was like wow (laughs) they were just like our culture is first yeah and like Mm -hmm. yeah maybe if that fits in we might do it but that wasn't going to fit in so we didn't do it yeah Yeah. and and and, i just got sick and got over it (laughs) yeah Yeah. and then and then but weren't any worse for the wear well, yeah. um, I mean, they're booming. Was, they're they're, fine. they're doing great. They've been doing fantastic. I mean, like all, all the sawmills out here, you know, they made a bunch of money in yeah. 2021, 20, 22. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's humbling to see that, you know, see human beings have, have that power and have that organizational yeah. community ability when so many of us don't. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, you, you kind of, you know, my, my, my mom's side of the family is, was Mennonite, um, but, oh. you know, they assimilated long ago. Um, but that's kind of like the give and take, you know, like I get to do, I get to do stuff like go on the Internet uh, <laughs> <laughs> drive a car, right. um, and not be Christian. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and, uh, so but, you know, it's, yeah. it's give and take, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. It's, it's just you just wonder how how can more people access community the way some the way it's possible some someday right. you know well another, another side of this equation though too is i think in in 50 years so probably more people descended from amish people than from the average american the, mm. the non-amish american in in this area because they're oh, having 12 12 kids whereas right. the average well, you know person having one or none or yeah that was one of the big things that blew me away by the peter zine work um is i didn't realize depopulation is such a thing going on right now like i I, because i was trained in like limits to growth um paul ehrlich the population bomb like kind of like the old environmentalism and have been learning to see beyond that for since i graduated but still you know leaves you with just like when we learned BS history in high school, like we're still spending the rest of our adult lives trying to get over that yeah, and get beyond that um, and relearn what's real. Right. But until I read some of that, some of that stuff, I didn't realize, wow, like, yeah, like depopulation is a big deal. Um, and de- the de- demographic collapse is like so real. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're kind of at peak population too. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's it's which in some ways you know if you had told me that you know 20 years ago i've been like celebrating like yeah of course that that's great that's what we all need like we're all like you know conventional environmentalist view is like we're all overpopulated and that's the issue and you still hear people i mean i heard um famous environmentalist blanking on her name say that the other day like people are still Mm -hmm. saying that i'm like wow um and it's like and now it's like it's also not necessarily even physically the case anymore you know right mm-hmm. yeah apparently china's past the point of um uh, of no return in terms of population total demographic demographic right. collapse there now just age wise europe um, europe so, as a whole yeah i mean most of the industrialized world the entire right. industrialized most of the industrialized world. world yeah it's really interesting and you think of it think of it in like gaia response type of way and it's like right. oh that yeah just kind of that's the way it goes you know <laughs> it's yeah <laughs> rise right. and fall <laughs> yeah population yeah. explosion and then reduction right. yeah. what yeah. doesn't work that what doesn't work that way <laughs> you know it's better better for it to happen as, in terms of people just like having less kids um than like 
right. lemmings jumping off a well, cliff, which, you know, who knows? Uh, yeah. Hopefully that doesn't yeah, no, happen that, either. That's, yeah, but, that's a really much better approach that we're in than, than if it was some Malthusian nightmare. You know. right <laughs> <laughs> which it may still also be that happening too. exactly yeah. <laughs> uh, well you know pleasant thoughts to uh... <laughs> yeah well we're so, not above um, nature which is there's some consolation in that you know yeah that's where i hear like people like elon musk and some of these folks who who have actually come to have in some ways more respect for than I originally did, but I'm still like, wow, these folks are such technologists and they're so human centric that it's like, mm-hmm. imagining a world without the earth, like I don't even want to do that. No. Yeah. It's like, it's not <laughs> about the people. It, yeah, it's, it's kind of like, since when did it become just about the people to begin with? Yeah. yeah. You know, and I just, I guess I never felt like it was. And, and then you realize, wow, a lot of people think that's the deal. It's about the people. And it's like, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't think I want to um, go along with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it totally goes like when you start looking at things from a more like Gaian perspective or animist perspective, um, you know, and you see like very clearly that we're not separate from nature, you know, we're yeah. not separate from the earth. Like we're right. like, <laughs> we're like the fingers of the earth or a finger. A, <laughs> you know, right. With that. You know, we're just that we're we're a product of <laughs> and not we're not even a product we're a, a part of it just a part of it mm-hmm. yeah Can't yeah we have a, we have a big body and it, it goes beyond our body <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> or what we think of as our little body right mm-hmm. yeah it's just interesting because it seems it seems so popular now like oh we'll be an intergalactic you know interplanetary species like you know, you think you'll live without the earth i don't know it's like it just yeah. seems to be missing the whole the whole thing i don't know well what i like about uh john michael greer talks about this as like the myth of of progress you know like this is the guiding mythos of industrial civilization is you know going from the caves to the stars Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's a (laughs) you know it's it's not necessarily true (laughs) right (laughs) probably not that's interesting right yeah that the whole like space thing playing out now um it's just yeah that's just the next manifest destiny yeah but it, i mean how is it gonna end in any other way than failure if we don't have the energy to do it <laughs> so. yeah yeah and and when you start thinking about it it's like oh well this is even if it works which is in any way shape or form works it's just going to be for like billionaires and maybe some <laughs> millionaires you know it's like it, yeah. i don't know it's just such a it's just such a farcical thing it's kind of weird I've been actually trying to take it seriously enough to like listen to some interviews like with Elon Musk and you're just like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> like you just said, it costs like, you know, however many millions of dollars to get a ton of weight into space. Yeah. So yeah. just the economics of it are that even if with so many changes are that it's going to be a rich person only thing, but then it's like, oh, maybe this will be great. All those people will somehow leave the earth. <laughs> and, leave, <laughs> and leave the rest to to everyone else i you know who knows i don't know yeah well but it, it doesn't seem... seems sorry it seems like an idea that only you know happens uh for people who are so insulated from reality that mm-hmm. makes sense to them <laughs> which a lot i mean all the million anybody who's a millionaire or a billionaire probably doesn't have uh an appreciation for what we think of as reality as far as as far as like a connection with the earth a connection with yeah. your food with life besides yeah human centric perspective yeah yeah it, it is true and it, it's not even their fault it's just the reality yeah. of inhabiting life and yeah when it's just that's just what happens um yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's it's interesting we're all everyone's everyone's a victim of their circumstances, even if, even if they're billionaires. And we're all just doing our best. Yeah. And trying to build resiliency. So for some people, it's figuring out how to get to space. And some people it's building mm-hmm. their 401k. And for some people it's planting sea berries and building swales and. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, and maybe those creative uh, pursuits um, will, will, bring value to fruition for for 
the whole somehow you know yeah, yeah. we'll see i guess <laughs> it was like a lot of waste though yeah no the space thing it just seems wow like i just think of like wow like who who gave us permission to go do what we've done here somewhere else <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i guess we don't need that i mean the implicit is we don't need the permission it's that's just what colonization is about right yeah but it's it's wild that it's like it's wild that we just don't even have the conversation like no one seems to even be having that conversation yeah well i think it comes from that materialist perspective the material reductionist perspective where you know matter is is dead and mm -hmm. it's all just a, a blank slate for us to project our will onto <laughs> right mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah i don't know so uh this has been a really interesting discussion <laughs> ben thank you for for yeah. talking with us but is there anything that you'd like to share with the listeners before we uh wrap it up um no, not really. I mean, I think I've, you know, this has been an interesting conversation talking about a lot of wide ranging things. And I mean, um, you know, we're, we're launching a lot of online co uh, courses right now that I've been meaning to do for years and we're finally doing nice. it. So just so we point people in that direction, we're having a wood heat deep dive and just like a lot nice. of like basic skills that, you know, um, cool. people need, um, we're going to be focusing on. That's really cool. So that's at wholesystemsdesign.com. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. There's a page on it. Sweet. And yeah. um, I also wanted to ask you, uh, what kind of changes are coming out with your new book or with mm -hmm. the revisions on your book? It's going to be that whatever that's happened in the 10 years since the first book. So, the, you know, they're 10 years apart. So the revision will have like a lot of greenhouses, cold frames that really never made it into the first book. Oh, so cool. I was just starting with some of those and I've now done like three, lived with three greenhouses since. Mm -hmm. um, a lot on like tools and management. You know, it's really the first 10 years, the book was really on heavily on system establishment. And then for the last 10 years has mostly been system management. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my focus has become management, pretty much not establishment. Mm -hmm. So that whole angle is woven into the book more now. Um, and uh, there's a section on raising a child on the homestead, like because mm. I have a five-year-old. So that's been biggest part of my last five years as anything. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a zone four permaculture piece, like growing wildlife, like the extensive promoting the forageable landscape because that's been a much bigger push on the other site uh and then just a whole edit you know throughout like things that just didn't work when i when they sounded when they seemed really cool in the first edition that i just kind of like set straight um yeah newer photos and getting to see certain things that didn't work like like plums had were great for the first 10 years then they all died basically oh, wow. you know I, I don't know after like a lot of things can look great for five, for like five to 10 years. That's still like a honeymoon period in perennials, but like mm -hmm. in 10 to 20, that's, you start to see what's really mm -hmm. happy in that area. If you don't just like give it tons of mulch every year for the first, <laughs> 10 years. you know, it's like, yeah. I don't know. It's just like a new veggie garden always looks amazing for like a year or two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's really valuable so information too. Cause a lot of, you know, a lot of people, a lot of projects haven't been going on for 10 20 years yeah 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 it's 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 important to have that realistic uh sense i think because things do change you know mm -hmm. after the honeymoon period <laughs> on the yeah. site the pests arrive they they figure it out you know oh yeah it's it's easy to have a really pest-free thing for two to six years Hmm. Yeah, that's a huge but, huge. but they learn the whole system's learning, right? So everyone, all the birds are learning. Mm -hmm. Everyone's learning. Hmm. It's a living system. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. So that that's I'd say some of the big changes in it. Awesome. awesome. Well, I'm really yeah. looking forward to that coming out. Definitely. Uh, Great. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. This has been really cool. Yeah. Thank you guys for doing it and. Uh, reaching out to people and sharing the good word.